Angela said I've done a sermon like this before. I don't know. I don't remember. I forget so many things. This is a new sermon that I wrote, uh, but maybe an old title. What are you full of? Right? What are you full of? And that's actually a kind of a normal question maybe to ask, right? But there's a phrase we say, you know, there's, there's phrases we have. I, I looked up online. I was like, hey, you know, there's a lot of things we say, you're full of blank, okay? Now, now careful what you're doing right now. <laughs> careful what you're thinking. Uh, there are many positive things, right? Uh, full of life. Full of energy. My grandkids come to my house, and man, they got energy for days. If I could bottle that and drink it, I'd get a lot more done. You know, we say full of energy, full of life, full of surprises, right? Or maybe full of years, some of us. That's a Bible phrase, right? He was full of years. Um, I'm feeling more full of years these days. On the negative side, there's sometimes we'll say, well, you're full of yourself. You ever heard said that? Or full of baloney, or many other iterations thereof. <laughs> full of hot air, right? You know, someone's like, hey, he's just full of hot air. He's just, he's just talking. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. He's full of hot air, right? You know, believe it or not, Jesus had something to say on the subject. He weighed in on, on, on being full of something. And uh, so I want us to look at Matthew chapter 12 this morning, if we could, at verse 34. You know, in the context of what we're going to read, Jesus has just healed a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. I mean, that's pretty impressive. He had a demon. He couldn't talk. Uh, he couldn't hear. Or, I'm sorry, he couldn't see. And, and he heals this guy. And, and some of the religious leaders were standing around, and, and they're like, there's no way that actually happened, or, or maybe it happened, but the only way it could happen is that Jesus himself is a demon, and that's why he could cast out a demon. Like, that makes a lot of sense. And so Jesus' retort, part of it at least, is found in, in verse 34 of Matthew chapter 12. And Jesus says to them, of course, his point is simply, you know, you're not kicking out. I mean, a demon can't kick out a demon. That's ridiculous. But then in verse 34, he says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruits. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. <clears throat> so what Jesus says and how he weighs in on the full of conversation, he says, look, you're all full of something, right? We are all full of something. And what comes out of your mouth indicates is indicative of what our hearts are full of and i think you know the key phrase here is is, is it comes out of what's stored up in your heart and we all have kind of these you know these weird thoughts and things that go through our minds and maybe feelings in our hearts sometimes and and you know we think oh my gosh i can't believe i thought that i must be a terrible person i'm not talking about that kind of stuff jesus says what have you stored up in your heart what you're full of is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to come out, right? It's going to come out of the things that we say. And I thought about this, and really, you know, the best analogy I could think of is kind of like, really, I think about computers. I'm, I'm going I'm to go away from sports analogies today. I'm going to computer analogies, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to broaden my, my horizons a little bit, even though I dropped out of computer science program when I was in college. Anyway, but you think about a computer, there's a hard drive, right? If you get a brand new, we all know what a hard drive is. You get a brand new computer, and that thing is awesome, right? It's like you can do whatever you want with it. The hard drive is clean. There's no problems. Uh, and if you have a Mac, it works great. And if you have a PC, it's probably going to come with some viruses already on it. That's usually what happens, right? Uh, but it shouldn't, but it happens quickly. Anyways, that's a sidebar. So, but you have this hard drive, right? And, and then, but the computer works only to the degree that you put something good on it. And so depending on what you put in it, what kind of programming you give it, then it might work great. But you put some bad programming, or perhaps you get a virus, and suddenly the whole thing doesn't work very well, does it? And I think about that, and really, there, there's bad programming. It's not, there's no bad hard drives, but only bad programming. That's, that's kind of how it goes. And so I believe God, and I think about this, and I think about how God created all of us in his image. In other words, the hard drive was good. 
The hard drive was awesome. The way God created us was amazing. He created us in his image to live as he intended. And that's an amazing thing. But what ends up happening is our hard drives get corrupted by bad programming. And I want to illustrate this. Look in Genesis chapter 3. I want to look at for a moment at an example of what I mean by bad programming and how the system gets corrupted. And then I want us to look at an example of good programming, what we can do about that. In Genesis 3, verse 3, of course, this is the example. We all know the story of Adam and Eve, you know, and how, uh, you know, how the sin came about, right? They, they ate the first, ate, ate the fruit they weren't supposed to eat. And then this conversation between Eve and the uh, serpent, it says, um, God did say, this is Eve talking, uh, God did say, we, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, so what ends up happening is you have two things going on. You have the word of God, right? God said, all right, guys, here's the deal. You got this whole thing right in front of you. You get the whole garden. You get the whole everything. Have at it. Enjoy. But don't eat from that tree. So you have the word of God. But then you also have sort of this, this, sens- this sensory experience, right, that they have, they have come to. Because, you, you know, the, 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 the serpent appeals to their senses. He says, wait, did you actually hear that from God? Calls that into question. I mean, and, and she looks. She sees the fruit, then they touch the fruit, they taste the fruit, like, like the, the senses kind of get engaged here, the experience comes into play. And so you have this, this, this tension immediately between God's word and their experience. Does that sound kind of familiar maybe to any of us? You know, we have, we, you know, we're pulled by our senses were pulled by uh, what we experience. You know, we are sensual beings, right? We are. And that, at times, runs counter to the Word of God. And so the question really becomes, what are we going to listen to? In Proverbs 14, verse 12, it says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. In other words, hey, there's times when everything in me says, my experience says, hey, that's the right thing, or I think that's right. And then over here, but God says something different. Well, guess what? You're probably wrong when it comes to, 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 to measuring up with God's word, right? Because God's word is ultimate. And so the hard drive, as we look at this, you know, Adam and Eve, their hard drives were, were corrupted by bad programming. And that's what sin is, isn't it? It's, it infects the way we think. And I think about this and just in terms of, you know, really, it, what do we put into our minds? What do we put into ourselves, right? What do we take in? And we, we tend to, that, that, that can, in many ways, it can mess up with our hard drive, right? So the way God created us, what we, what we put into our minds, you know, because thoughts lead then ultimately to feelings and it'll lead to actions, right? And what we think about, what, what do we dwell on? What do we focus on? What do we think about? It's a question I want us to kind of consider here for a moment. You know, there's such a, so much that, it, that comes at us every day. You know, if we sat and, and, and you know, watched, you know, TikTok all day, you probably would have some kind of a feeling about the world, right? Or if you, you know, read, listen to Fox News all day, you're going to have a certain view, about things. You watch MSNBC all day, you're going to have to feel a certain way about things. Or if you, you know, whatever you choose to think about, or you watch ESPN, I don't know, you pick your thing, right? It's like, what is it? What is it? What's your vice? But what we fill ourselves with is what we tend to focus on, what we think about. And that can, you know, guys, you know, we need to be careful what we put in. I, I love that, that uh, I, I have an iPhone. And I love they kind of tell me once a week what my screen time is. You ever get a little screen time notification? Your screen time is up 20% last week, or it's down 15%. You know, it's, it's had kind of a, I'm always humbled when I see that. You know, it's like, oh, snap, I was on my phone too much last week. Like, I was on there, what, for four and a half hours? When did I do that? I was on my phone for four and a half hours. Yeah, you were. 
You know, and it, what are we bringing in, right? What are we allowing in to our hearts and our souls? I want to look at Ephesians chapter 1. You know, Paul, uh, Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, I think, is, a, is an example of good programming. How, how can we program ourselves in a positive way, right? Um, in chapter 1, verse 15, he says this. He says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that, God our, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his, inglorious her- his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly heavenly realms, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. We're talking about fullness, right? You know, I think God wants you to be full. He wants you to be full of it, full of Jesus, right? There's something God wants us to be full of. And, and, and Paul prays this. He's like, look, I, you know, fullness of Christ, is that, that's the goal. You know, I, I think about church and I think about, you know, what do we do? You know, I, I, I sit around. This is kind of what I do, right? I, I think a lot of times in big picture, like, hey, what's happening with the congregation? Where are we going? And, and you know, one of the things we have to, I have to ask myself sometimes is, what is the purpose of what we're doing? Right? That's a fair question, isn't it? Why am I here? What are we doing? I mean, it's great. I love everybody and what's going on. But what is it that we are doing? What's the goal? Is the goal to be a big church? I remember when we moved to, Angela and I moved here in 1996. Uh, some of y'all were here uh, when that happened. My remark Mark and Maddie were there. We were in the parking lot. Angela was pregnant out to here with Stasia. Uh, and, and we introduced the church and it started... It, it, and they, it rained, and, they, and the, the people didn't show up to open the door to the church that we were meeting in. So we're standing in the parking lot waiting to get in. The, guy, the people didn't show up, and we stand in a circle, and Angela's, you know, about to pop, and it starts raining. And, of course, this is Austin, Texas. It's August. Everyone was actually happy that it was raining. I think it hadn't rained in a long time, and so I'm kind of like, what is this place, and what's going on? And, but it was a ragtag little bunch, right? We were like maybe 40 people out there or something. And I remember thinking, my gosh, I would, if, if the church could just grow, wouldn't that be great? And you know, I remember when we hit 100 people, and we thought, wow, isn't that amazing? We had 100 people in the church. I can't believe it. we finally got to 100. Isn't it awesome? And it's like, yeah, but you know what? If we could be 200, that'd be really cool. And we get to 200, you know, at one point. And it was like, wow, isn't that amazing? And I, you know, this is kind of how I think. I'm just kind of, but, but you have to stop and ask myself, is that the goal? To be a big church? We're a pretty big church now. When you, especially when you consider tribe and east side and all this together. You know what? What happens with big church? Big problems. You multiply the number of issues, the number of stuff going on. It's like, I kind of go, man, wasn't it so nice when we were only 40? <laughs> It was a lot better. And so I have to ask myself, what's the purpose? And you know, when I read what Paul writes, Paul goes, hey, you know what? Paul, the missionary, Paul, the guy who planted churches in so many places, he says, you know what's most important? What I, my prayer for you is that you would be full. Is that we, we would be full. We'd be full of Christ. That's our goal. Now, I pray we grow along with that. And you know what? Other folks come along to join us. And that's, that's kind of, obviously, we want that. But really, the goal is to be full. That's what we're driving for. And Paul says that. He says, I pray that you'll be full of Christ. That's the goal. And he says three things in this prayer, I think, that are helpful for us as we think about that. The first one is, I, he says, I pray that you will know him better. Look, you know, God reveals Jesus to us through his spirit, I believe, a wisdom, revelation. And there's a mystical side to that, obviously, that God does something in us. When I say mystical, I don't mean like, you know, magic. I just mean God does something in us that we cannot explain. There's a work of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But there's also, I think we have to understand that really 
the, the scripture, we have, we have a real, the concrete side of this, and that is the scripture that, 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 that talks about Jesus and how that's fundamental for knowing him better. You know, reading scripture is not merely about understanding right and wrong and, hey, what, what should I, shouldn't I do so I can get into heaven? It's about knowing Jesus. And that's a very simple paradigm shift, but a very profound and important one for us. Because many of us, we like our religion simple and neat. Tell me what to do. Tell me when to stand up. Tell me when to sit down. Tell me when to go. And I'll I'll do all that stuff so I know that I'm good with God. But that's not what Scripture is. Scripture is about knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself in John chapter 5, verse 37 says... And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Jesus is like, look, he, he says, you're doing it wrong, man. You're reading this thing to try to, like a rule book, trying to figure out what to do. And that's not the point. All of it points to me. That's where life is. And so Paul prays that we would know Jesus. Not reading for the sake of reading. Not reading for a list of do's and don'ts. But reading to know and to be full of Christ. It's the best way to program our minds the right way is to fill it with the Word of God. Is that, is that what you fill your mind with? I mean, really, honestly, I mean, take a hard look at yourself. What do, what do you spend more time looking at and taking in? In your, in your extra time, I know you got jobs and school and that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's not a fair question entirely. But, but you know, in your, when, you, when your choice, when I've got, I, what am I taking in? You know, Paul's prayer is that we would know Jesus. He says in Philippians, Philippians 3.10, he says, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul was so into being, knowing Jesus that he's like, I, I don't just want to know. I want to actually kind of go through the stuff he went through. So if Jesus suffered, I'll, I'll make him suffer so I can understand him better. I want to participate in him. I mean, that, that's, that's bold. That's bold. And so the second prayer, he says, is to know the hope to which he has called you. You know, so know, G, know him better. He wants us to know the hope that we've been called to. In other words, put stock in the right things. Understand the hope that you have in Christ. The riches of his glorious inheritance. He's talking about us, right? We are the riches of his glorious inheritance. You know, being God's people supersedes all things. It changes the way we build our lives. And so if you think about it this way, it's like, hey, you know, are we, where are our priorities? Where do they lie? Know the hope to which he has called you. Paul prays that for them, that you would understand how awesome it is and that you would prioritize your life in that way. What's our priorities? What are your priorities? Is it a priority to know Christ? To be connected, to be with God's people, to love. I mean, to, to be like Christ, is that, that, that's got to be our priority. And again, I know I'm talking largely to a room full of people who have made Jesus Lord of their life. But I also understand that, you know, living, following Jesus is like being a living sacrifice. The thing about a living sacrifice is they can wiggle off the altar. altar. And sometimes, you know, we kind of prioritize things and then those priorities kind of get, get bounced around a little bit in time. And, and suddenly we, we don't realize it, but we have shifted in the way that, we, the way that we're living our lives. And so my, my admonition to us is to, is, I'm poking you. Hey, how is our, where are our priorities? Are they, are they still aligned with God? And then Paul prays the third thing. He says that you would know his incomparably great power. And so we would know the power of God. You know, it's the same power, he says, that raised Jesus from the dead. You know, becoming full of Jesus, being like him, is only possible because of the power of God. Otherwise, we couldn't do it. We're not capable of that within ourselves. The power 
comes because we know him, because we know the hope that we have. And sometimes we kind of go in the wrong direction. We seek the power first. Like, you know, if I can just see God's work in my life, then I'll be like, I'll try to be like Jesus. No, it goes the other way around. We know him. We prioritize based on the hope of the inheritance we have. And then God shows his power in us. It's that's, that, that's the progression, not the other way around. When you put the power first, it becomes very humanistic, doesn't it? Well, let me just kind of manufacture some kind of something. So I, it's some faith. No, no, no. It's about God working in us. His power. We do have the power to change. Change ourselves. To change, help others change. We have that power within us because, because of God's work in us. But I think that power becomes self-evident from our proximity to Jesus. The closer we are to him, the more it comes out. It's the fullness. It's what comes out of us. It's the full, being filled with him in every way. So my question this morning for us simply as we close out is what is, what are we full of? What kind of fruit is hanging on your tree? And I don't mean that as any kind of judgment statement. We all have the ability to alter our, own, our programming, right? What are we going to take in to change our minds and change our lives? You know, and, and, and so the question kind of becomes, well, where, where we got to go this morning? Where, where do you need to go this morning? What are the areas of your life perhaps you want to be filled? You need to be more filled with Jesus. And so here's a couple of maybe, maybe practicals to, to, to help us as we think about this. One would be, you know, read Scripture to know Jesus. That might be some kind of simple shift. Maybe you read your Bible every day already, but maybe just how about instead of reading it just for information, how about reading it to see Jesus in it? right? Just a, a shift. Or perhaps, hey, you're new to faith, new to the congregation, like, hey, I don't really read the Bible very often. Well, how about just committing to reading the Bible every day? Just read every day. Take some time. To know Jesus, start with the gospel, right? Pick Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and just, just read every day and get to know Jesus. Because he, he is, he, he's where it's at. That's, what, that's, that's the goal is to know him. Secondly, you know, reorient your priorities to reflect eternal awareness. You know, when you're aware, I, okay, example, I am 56 years old. I almost, I'll be 56 this week. Yep, so, you know, hit me with the gifts, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'll be 56 this week. And, you know, I started thinking about things like, I mean, I never care about retirement ever. Like, whatever, I'm just going to flame out. I'm just going to preach till I die, whatever. You know, you start, you start thinking about, you know, we were gone. We were out for a month on vacation. The retirement sounds kind of nice. And I'm not retiring. Don't worry. I know you're concerned. But I started thinking, you start thinking about long term. I started thinking, okay, can I? When can I? Am I prepared? Maybe I should reorient some of my life so that I don't, you know, I, I'm not a burden to the church. You know what I'm saying? You start thinking about things differently when you start realizing there's a reality that's down the lines, not so far down the line that I should be thinking about for my own life. You understand what I'm saying? And so that requires then some reorientation around whatever that priority is. If I want to retire at 85, like I'm on track to do, <laughs> then I'm kidding. But, you know, but, you know, I need to, or if I want to retire at 59, ha ha ha, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do either. If I want to retire at some point, you pick a time, you kind of go, okay, well, then I have to kind of reverse engineer that and go, what do I need to do to be prepared to do that, right? That's kind of a reality. And I think about that in our spiritual lives. What's the end that we're going for? And, and are the priorities of my life oriented around that? Yesterday, we had a wonderful marriage uh, seminar. And uh, it was fantastic for those of you who were there. One of the things they did to illustrate is they had us all put our names of our children on the wall. And it was up there the entire day behind the speaker. And as we talked about marriage in the context of having great relationships, you know, it was like, that's your why. Because your kids are watching and they're growing up and they're, they're learning from you. And so for you to have a great marriage, you want, you, we all want that for our children. And so are we, you know, really putting the work in, right? That's an example of having, you're going, okay, there's an end in mind. I, I've got a why to what I'm, what I'm doing. And I think that's how we've got to orient our, our walk with God. We can't, we can't just, we don't just float along and kind of go, okay, it's just going to happen to us. There has to be deliberation and, and intentionality, right? 
reorienting our priorities to reflect the eternal awareness of, of our situation with God. And then just knowing that God has given you the power to change. Guys, we all have it within us. God's given us a spirit. And so as we reorient our values and we, and we really try to know Jesus better, we're not just doing this as some kind of humanistic effort. We actually have the spirit of God to, to help us. And to give us the power to be able to do that. And so I, was, I encourage us all this morning as we think about that. What are we full of? We're all full of something, right? Hopefully we can be full of Jesus. That really is our goal. Let's go to God in prayer now.